Good morning, everyone. You can hear me all right, yes? Um, I'm going to talk about surveying f from a P&I aspect and also mainly for the crew aspects. Um, <clears throat> when the surveyor, the appointed surveyor goes to the ship, he should <coughs> organise himself in a proper manner by uh, informing the master of the vessel or the ship's agent to inform the master of his requirements and what he needs to complete the proper survey. And if he needs to uh, cite documents on board, he should tell them which documents so there's no hold up. And the one big no-no is that he should never affect the uh, running, discharging or loading of the cargo of the ship. So there are limitations right away. So if he wants to survey three or four ballast tanks, he should tell the ship in advance. And uh, in <coughs> for, for cargo ships, he, uh, he should also be in a position to survey the cargo holds when they're empty. So he's got to time his visit in a proper manner. It may happen when he gets to the ship that uh, all, the, all the ballast tanks are fully ballasted and so it's impossible for him to cite those. <coughs> but he should come prepared with a memory stick so he can download the, uh, the ship's photographs of the ballast tanks and, any, and also cite and, and, if necessary, copy any inspection records which the, the ship may have. He's there to find defects. So he's not the most popular person in the world with shipping, ship, ship owning companies because what he finds to be repaired costs money. Um, he should be <coughs> able and take many, plenty, plenty of photographs. I think up to a couple of hundred, although one client of mine and now is asking for a thousand photographs. But he still wants the ship surveyed in a day, so. I don't know. The, uh, when the surveyor is uh, faced with a chemical tanker or product tanker, 99 times out of 100, of course, he can't gain access to these tanks. So again, he needs the memory stick, download recent photographs so that the P&I club can get it. <coughs> an idea of what risk they're faced with with possible cargo contamination claims. <clears throat> we do not want nitpicking defects from the surveyor. If we find them at the P&I Club, we delete them. We don't, <coughs> we don't want to cause unnecessary aggro with the ship owner. The surveyor should um, presents his preliminary report in a timely manner. I think within 24 hours, but the, the norm seems to be 48 hours. And the final report should be submitted, I think, in a, within three or four days, together with all the photographs. There are various <coughs> uh, things that should be checked. Entry into enclosed spaces is a perennial problem. Half the time, the oxygen and the, uh, gas meters are not properly calibrated. So with me, I get the chief officer to go down. And then to the merriment of the crew, I say, I want him to go down there and start singing. If he stops singing, I'm not going down. So, and then you have to adapt your survey to the nationality of the crews. With the Indian, Indian ships, cricket is the answer. You know, you talk about cricket, they're into that, you know. Filipino ships is boxing. 
and any other ship, we go down to football. If you do find yourself saddled with a Manchester United master or chief engineer, you just cancel the survey and walk off. <laughs> <coughs> When you're going around, you've usually got a very junior member of the crew with you. Half the time they don't go in the tank or the, or the cargo hold, so you, you have to impress on them that you, they have to come down and, fi and see what the defect is. <coughs> and if you've got them on side, i.e. you've talked about Tendulkar or whoever it is about cricket, he says, then they do the job for you. They say, well, come and have a look at this, come and have a look at that, come and have a look. We've told them before, you know, that, that these uh, things need attention. But either the master or the chief officer, they don't send the reports to the company, or if they do, the company don't want to spend the money. Uh, the surveyor should pay particular attention to safety aspects, starting with the gangway and the, the safety net underneath, etc., etc. It should be safe. The main deck is one of the main items to be checked. It should be well painted. Uh, no, no serious defects. With bulk carriers, the problem area is normally the uh, cross decks between the hatches, which get neglected. It's more difficult to paint there because of Hatch, hatches, pipes, etc. Uh, <coughs> the scantlings on these cross decks are reduced scantlings. It's not part of the uh, longitudinal strength of the ship. <coughs> but those areas, nonetheless, are a, a big source of repair the, and proper repairs. We don't accept doubling plates. We want proper insert plates fitted a proper job done really. Ship side rails should be free of damage, many times they're not. <coughs> Sounding pipes, air pipes should be in good condition, labelled with the place with the space survey uh, specified. Bunker stations should be checked. There should be large save holes, of course, in, <coughs> in place with uh, up to US Coast Guard requirements. Many times you find diesel oil tanks, uh, lube oil tanks, fuel oil tanks, air pipes and sounding pipes do not have a save hole in place. So if there is <coughs> overfilling of the tank, there is a spillage and a pollution possible pollution claim. The cargo holds need to be carefully inspected. And by carefully, I mean the say physically goes in the cargo hold and goes down. It doesn't take pictures from the deck, as many do. Uh, <coughs> the condition of the cargo holds can be badly affected by previous cargoes. Sulfur, it, like sulfur eats steel. Coal cargoes contain sulphur. These areas need to be really, really carefully checked. The connections with uh, sideshell frames and brackets to the tank top can be affected by erosion caused by the sulphur content in the cargoes. Um, the bilges should be checked. There's too many of these reports and I and, and others have got a tick the box thing. Bill Jewell's checks, yes or no. That, that's, they should be thoroughly checked, photographs taken. Um, and in, in many bulk carriers he says there are uh, 
water ingress alarms fitted. They should be checked that they work. Um, the fixed firefighting, if the ship is carrying coal, we, we, we need a fixed firefighting system, usually CO2. <coughs> then we come to the hatch covers. If many defects with the hatch covers are over compression of the rubber packing. The crew feel that by tightening up and tightening up and tightening up the cleats, they will make the uh, cover watertight. That's not true. The hatch cover sits on resting pads and the hatch cover cleats are simply there to keep the hatch cover in place when the ship's at sea. Uh, on, <coughs> on bulk carriers, generally the, there is a dedicated heavy weather ballast hold. Those holds should have additional uh, quick acting cleats in place and the, the surveyor should be checking. He should check anyway the number of cleats per, per hatch. He should check the, uh, <coughs> normally it's a stainless steel compression bar on the combing, that that's undamaged straight without defects. And the channel for the, where the uh, compression bar sits should be in reasonable condition, not pristine painted, but at least free of rust, rust and scale. In the corners of the, uh, <coughs> of the hold of, a, of the hatch combing, there are normally drain holes. If it's a big hold, there may be more than, more than two in each corner. So maybe, maybe, um, they should have a, a pipe with an on-return valve, all these items should be strictly checked. Uh, the, hatch uh, the hatch cover packing I've mentioned, but there should be no sign of over compression. If there is over compression, the hatch covers are not watertight. Uh, end of story. Then we come to the, the water ballast tanks. We normally ask, for, as a P&I club, for about three ballast tanks to be surveyed. And it's no good the surveyor just pitching up and saying, I want to go look in the four peak, the aft peak, and one or two others. He should have already <coughs> advised the ship well in advance of what his requirements are, so that the ship can prepare and, uh, for the survey and everything is, just goes smoothly. But the surveyor is checking for coating breakdown, rust, waste, cracks, and any excessive diminution of the steel. The tanks in an ideal world should be free of any debris, rust scaling, sand. I, know, I realize at times masters have got no choice where they, where they, uh, they, they, where they have to take ballast. They, but if the ship is full of bloody sand, we don't know what's underneath. Corrosions, cracks. Deference to the last speaker, coatings on ships are the biggest bane of any surveyor's life, I'll tell you. Uh, I mentioned briefly about uh, cargo tanks uh, on chemical tankers and product tankers. They are a source of very excessive claims for P&I. And 99 times out of 100, of course, the surveyor can't get in those tanks. So he needs to obtain recent photographs from the ship with his sturdy memory stick. If he can't get them there, he, he can go to, back to the owner and ask, or you can cite the inspection reports. Ballast tanks are normally inspected fairly frequently on ships. Every six months it used to be in the company I worked for. And uh, he may find that uh, anodes have been fitted 
in my view, they are just a means of uh, postponing the inevitable. The ship needs possible steel renewals. Certainly the coatings have gone. So they fit, they fit these anodes to postpone the inevitable. If I can appreciate if the ship owner is intending to uh, sell the ship in the next year or so, okay, we, we do, do it that way. But if you're doing a pre-purchase survey, of course, you're very, you don't want to be saddling your new client with the cost of dry docking, blasting, and recoating all the ballast tanks on the ship. It's, uh, it's a very lengthy process. Before and after the survey, the, the surveyor should, and it's mandatory from my point of view, should discuss with the master, chief engineer, and the chief officer how he wants to conduct the survey, and he should plan that the survey in such a way, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, the cargo operations are unaffected by what he's doing. And at the end of the survey, again, he should... Uh, have a closing meeting with the crew, with the uh, master chief engineer, chief officer, pointing out the defects. Sometimes there's an argument, so we take him, we go back down to the tank, or we go back uh, to the engine. I haven't mentioned the engine room yet, but uh, but the engine room we do, <coughs> we need a thorough survey of the engine room. We need to see generator running. It's not a hull and machinery survey that we're doing here, but uh, it's, uh, we need to check that at least one of the, it's normally two or three generators, <coughs> that one is working satisfactorily. You should also test and run the emergency f uh, gen diesel generator. You should also test the emergency fire pump with two wildly spaced hoses, i.e. one forward, one aft. That is to comply with SOLAS anyway, but we find on many ships that the hoses are damaged. If you, you haven't got the time to reel, reel out every single hose on the ship, but you, the, when they test the emergency fire pump, there's a 50-50 chance that the hose they're, test, they're using for the test leaks. And uh, one job I got when I was with the Standard Club years ago was to go out to uh, Turkey. It was a Turkish container ship op operator, a very good one, I might add. And uh, they thought because they were Turkish, they were being uh, put upon a bit by the port state control possibly some truth in that. Anyway, I, I go along. And this, the first ship I did happened to be on a Saturday. So, and I go on board and they said, oh, hello, Bill. I said, no, no, it's not Bill. I'm not the p and i man. I'm the fellow from the Port State Control. So you will check my identity. You will check my bloody bag. There's no bomb in there or... And so anyway, we go on. And where do you want to, what do you, I said, I'm just going to be like a port state control surveyor. I'm, I'm just going to stand by the lifeboats and issue orders. Okay, all right, we'll do that. So we start off. I said, okay, we'll start with the emergency <coughs> fire pump. I want a hose forward and a hose aft. Two hours later, they couldn't get, they hadn't got the fire pump working. So, and then eventually they got it, they got it going. I go on the aft deck and the hose is leaking like a sieve. I said, there's two lessons here. I said, you know the surveyor's going to ask for this particular test. So hours before he gets here, you test it yourself. Not five minutes before he gets there, so he puts his hand on the bloody pump and finds it's hot. And I said, uh, and if I was a proper uh, port state control surveyor, the ship would be detained until you replace this hose, this defective hose, and meanwhile, we'll check every single hose on the ship. And today is Saturday. You, you've got, you haven't got much chance of getting a replacement hose. Tomorrow's Sunday, you've got no bloody chance. So the ship is delayed by two, two days off hire. It's big money, you know? I 
so 90% of this is common sense, you know? And, uh, and I feel for the crews who I think do their very, very best, you know? That, when I was working for Blue Funnel, we had a ship, a new building in uh, Denmark, and there was a national strike coming off. And the shipyard bent their backs to get the ship out, unfinished, but in a position where we could sail to Hamburg and, get, and, get, and finish off. So the crew, a Liverpool crowd I might add, come out, and the last thing that they want to do is lug hoses around the bloody deck. But I had them lugging all these hoses as we hose tested all the hatch covers, all the hatch combs, everything, you know. And my boss said to me, why don't you go down the crew bar and buy them a beer? I said, they've worked for 12 hours out there on that deck in freezing cold weather. I said, if, if I went in the crew bar and, <coughs> and offered them one beer, I'd be over the side, you know. Well, what are you proposing? I said, I'll get two or three cases. Two or three cases? I said, yeah, 50 pence a case it was in those days, you know. It's nothing. So the ship owner doesn't like spending money. That's uh, or wasting money. Anyway, I'll just show you some uh, examples of what we find. Actually, that's the mooring ropes are in good condition. We've got a fire hose here, which is far too short. Uh, cargo manifest, it's not all bad stuff. That one's good. Main engine is okay. The floor plates are in good condition. This is a ballast tank. Now, that didn't happen overnight. So you might ask, what's the class of air playing at? What's the superintendent of the ship playing at? For a ship to deteriorate like that. There used to be coatings in there. There's hardly any steel left now, you know. Vent, a similar situation with the vent. This is a fire pump. It actually worked, surprisingly enough. But look at the state, there's no maintenance. Maintenance costs money. Hatch combings, top plate in poor condition. There's no drain holes, so any water that gets in that channel will end up in the, car, in the cargo hold, and if it's a water-sensitive cargo, we, we get a claim. Another ballast tank, a double bottom tank. You can see that there's been an anode put in there probably several years earlier, but not replaced, and certainly no repairs have been done to the tank. Uh, the hatch combing is actually not bad, but the main deck is pitted. Similar situation with the hatch combing top plate, it's a very poor. It's, it's complete lack of maintenance. If you look carefully at the top uh, part of the, uh, the rubber packings, you see it's over, over, over compressed. So that hatch cover will leak for sure. Here we have a rarity, an air pipe, diesel oil air pipe enclosed by a save hole. Uh, accommodation deck in poor condition. Test of the emergency fire pump is fine, but the deck is pitted. Uh, here we have uh, air pipes of a diesel oil tank, but no save oil. So if, <coughs> if they over uh, fill these tanks, we've got oil all over the deck and a possible pollution claim. Fire hose connections are damaged. And for me, this is a big no-no in shipbuilding to have a, a doubling plate on the outside shell like that. It, well, I used to work for Lloyd's Register. It's certainly not approved by Lloyd's. And I don't think it's approved by any of the IAC societies. And that's it for me. I might be a bit premature, but uh, there you are. <laughs> <laughs> eh? Thank you, Bill. Okay.